a few seconds, I'll change the PowerPoint. Our next speaker is Professor Andrew Mile, a professor of geology at the University of Toronto and the co-author of the February 3rd Joint Canada-Alberta Implementation Plan for Oil Sands Monitoring. Since 2003, Professor Mile has worked at the intersection between energy and environment. From 2007 until 2009, Professor Mile was the president of the Academy of Science of the Royal Society of Canada. Since 1998, Professor Mile has taught a popular science for non-scientists course at the University of Tor Tor Toronto titled Geology and Public Issues, which deals with geological hazards, energy and water resources, and global change. Andrew Mile also serves as a panelist on symposia in the program on water issues at the Monk School of Global Affairs here at the University of Toronto on such topics as carbon sequestration, shale gas, and Canada's oil sands. Professor Miles' topic tonight is environmental management of the Alberta oil sands. Well, good evening, ladies and gentlemen, and uh, thank you, Tom, for the introduction, and uh, thank you, Greg, for that uh, really uh, fascinating summary of what is indeed an uh, extremely important uh, industry to Canada. Um, my involvement in the uh, oil sands uh, began uh, in the uh, fall of 2010 uh, at a time when uh, uh, international interest in the oil sands was at a peak. There were uh, protests going on in Europe and in Washington and elsewhere in the U.S. about uh, quote-unquote Canada's dirty oil. And uh, both levels of government in Canada, the, the government of Alberta and the federal government, had become very concerned about Canada's international reputation as a, an environmental steward uh, and uh, <clears throat> were, were responding to Canadian citizens quite legitimate concerns about the environmental management of this very large and significant industry. So in the, uh, in the fall of 2010 the Alberta government established a panel to look at the problem and decide what to do about it. Excuse me, the federal government, the uh, uh, federal minister at the time, Jim Prentice, <coughs> established a panel and I was part of that and then in January 2011 uh, the Alberta government followed up with a panel, a larger panel, a much more diverse group of individuals charged with the same task to look at the uh, issue from a provincial perspective and uh, over time, and I'll talk a bit more about the work of those two panels later, over time the two levels of government came together to establish what uh, uh, Greg quite correctly referred to as the Joint Implementation Plan, which was announced just in, uh, in February of this year. So things are moving along quite quickly. Now, we look at the uh, oil sands. Um, this is what it looks like before the, uh, the, the mining processes actually begin. This was taken from a helicopter during our first tour of the oil sands in November 2010. We're about to land on the Steep Bank River, which is just to the east of uh, one of the big... Uh, plants, the Suncor uh, Voyager plant, just uh, off the picture to the left. This is the bank of the Steep Bank River, and you can see the, uh, the, the oil sands are actually exposed, particularly on the left side of the river there. Uh, all of that is to be stripped off as part of the surface mine. Uh, as you can see, a thickness of uh, several tens of meters of sand is a huge volume of material required to be removed and processed. This is what the pristine boreal forest looks like, part of it anyway. Uh, and all of that will go, uh, as it will, of course, over huge areas of, uh, uh, of the so-called mineable area of the oil sands north of Fort McMurray. So it's an extremely large operation. Anybody who's uh, uh, looked for the oil sands on Google Earth will have very quickly found these enormous sites where strip mining has been, been uh, uh, taking place and the large tailings ponds that contain the, uh, the residue sitting there waiting to be cleaned up. Now, uh, <coughs> Greg uh, quite uh, correctly talked about this new group called Canada's Oil Sands Innovation Alliance, and uh, I do think this is a very important uh, step forward in the management of the oil sands. This is a brand new initiative. Uh, it so happens the executive director of the, uh, of the alliance is the former director of water programs at Environment Canada, a, uh, 
a very distinguished water scientist called Dan Wicklum, who we work with on the federal panel, and he's now uh, in Calgary, has taken over the leadership of this group. And uh, what it uh, speaks to is the fact that the industry, I think, has quite clearly recognized the significance of the problems they're dealing with, the scales of the operations, and the need to be very responsible about their management. Uh, so let's look at, uh, quickly at some of the issues that have to be dealt with on the ground, the air, the water, the groundwater, uh, and some of the other issues. And I'm going to go through some slides here quite quickly. Now, it, it, I should uh, mention that these were put together, the information on these slides was put together uh, in cooperation with uh, Adele Hurley, who's the Director of Water Programs at the Monk School, and David Schindler, the environmental scientist uh, whose work uh, has helped more than anybody else to bring the oil sands problems to public attention. It was publication of one of his papers in the summer of 2010 that uh, really caught the media attention and uh, uh, made the governments realize they need to, to, uh, to work on this. So this material we put together, three of us, for a forum we held on the oil sands at the Monk School here at the University of Toronto, uh, last uh, last spring, nearly a year ago now, in fact. So air pollution issues, let's start there. And as Greg quite correctly mentioned, there is a very effective organization there called the Wood Buffalo Environmental Association uh, that is managing the monitoring of the air very effectively. Uh, and in large measure, that's because of the very high quality scientists that they're involved in doing this. And this is one of the things that we emphasize very strongly in our panel reports, the need for first-class scientists, very well-trained scientists, at least, many of them are, at least as a PhD level, capable of carrying out independent research and uh, uh, investigating pollution problems and publishing freely without uh, government or industry involvement or interference. And we'll talk a bit more about the governance of environmental management in a minute because this is very, a very important part of the whole process. So air pollution issues uh, <coughs> are related partly to things like stack emissions, and you can see some of the stacks emitting away there in the background. Um, and also in this picture you'll see two things that were a uh, very visible part of the environmental problem, two things that likely will not ever be repeated in the management of the oil sands. They've given rise to a lot of the issues, the concerns about, about environmental pollution, uh, but they re represent old ideas and old technologies. Over here, for example, you'll see what's left of pond number one, which was the first a uh, tailings pond that was established on the banks of the Athabasca River, literally right in a channel of the Athabasca River, built about something called the Tar Island Dyke, which is just out of, uh, out of view there. I'll have a couple more images of this later. But the, uh, the issue of tailings being stored behind a dike right next to the Athabasca River is something that's given concern to everybody, of course, because of the danger of the leakage of, of poisoned waters into the Athabasca. I don't think that's actually happening, but it's being watched very carefully. But it's very unlikely that a tailings pond like this will ever be built in that kind of situation again. Another uh, <clears throat> piece of old technology is this large pile of coca dust here on the banks of the river, which is just uh, an enormous pile of coke dust, literally. And uh, uh, every time the wind blows, it uh, is picked up and blows into the air. You see pictures of the Athabasca River taken uh, in the winter time when it's frozen. The ice over here is all deep brown in color because it's covered with airborne coke dust. So that, again, is the source of a lot of the airborne pollution, and it's unlikely that that will ever be allowed to happen again. So there are a number of things that already are being taken care of, but they're still, of course, highly visible. A lot of other sources of pollution, uh, obviously the movement of equipment and the disturbance of the land uh, churns up a lot of material into the air. Uh, a lot of these... Uh, uh, the substances here, the heavy metals, the polyaromatic uh, compounds, uh, it's now been demonstrated, do come from the uh, upgraders and other processing facilities. This is something that was uh, not fully believed by everybody for a long time, and it's one of the pieces of work that David Schindler has demonstrated most uh, convincingly, as uh, I'll show you in a minute. Turning to quickly to uh, groundwater pollution, uh, a diagram that shows the uh, groundwater circulation systems. There's shallow freshwater circulation uh, from recharge, upland recharge areas, water descends into the subsurface and then is discharged into lakes and ponds. Any uh, interference with that, such as, for example, uh, surface mines, uh, will disturb the groundwater system. And it, uh, <coughs> it's an open question, one that's not been fully explored yet, how much the surface mining operations are, uh, are polluting the groundwater system. 
Um, there's been very little regional work done on this, very little baseline work, so not very much is known about that, something that needs to be examined. Uh, Greg referred to the deep saline uh, water system that, that flows largely in the Devonian limestone rocks underneath the oil sands, and this is, this is becoming increasingly a source of the waters that are used by the industry and then recycled back down into it. This is saline water that is, quite frankly, of no use to anybody else. It's saline. It moves very slowly in the subsurface. Uh, and it does seem uh, the best or the least worst option, if you like, if we have to use a lot of water, this is where we should get it from and where we should put it back. Uh, it's never likely to be used by anybody else, and by and large, it will stay fairly close to where it's put. There is a very, very slow updip flow out to the east, uh, but that's something of, of a long-term issue that would need to be examined separately. Turning to uh, surface waters, it's been known for a very long time that the oil sands do in fact seep right into the Athabasca River. This picture uh, that's from the, the CAP website shows uh, an oil seep, the kind of thing that takes place on hot summer days when the, the warmth of the sun heats the bitumen and uh, reduces its viscosity so that it actually flows down into the water. And of course that will therefore pollute the water with whatever uh, the oil consists of. And uh, the government of Alberta claimed for a long time that that's where most of the water pollution came from, was from seeps like this. Uh, but it turns out that a lot of the chemicals that are found in the water uh, only have an industrial origin, and uh, so that turns out to be uh, incorrect. One of the problems that has bedeviled this whole issue is the very poor quality of water monitoring that has been underway in that area for a long time. And I'm not going to say too much more about this, because hopefully this will be corrected. But there's an organization called the Regional Aquatic Monitoring Program that was charged with the responsibility of doing water quality monitoring by the Alberta government back in the 19, late 1970s. And it's, uh, it's done a very poor job for a whole variety of reasons. It was not properly staffed. Uh, it was very poorly managed. Uh, the results were not published. The whole operation was not very transparent. And it's been widely criticized uh, a number of times peer reviews have been done of its operations, and it's the source of a lot of the problems surrounding the oil sands in the sense that nobody believes the results from RAMP, and so the whole industry and the government running it have had a, gained a bad reputation because of that. Uh, to a considerable extent, I think that's quite unfair. These were certainly good people doing the work. They were just not the right people uh, at the right time with the right kind of setup. Those were the kinds of problems that we examined with the uh, work of these two panels and the recommendations that we made hopefully uh, will enable that to be overcome. I'm going to, <coughs> excuse me, going to show you three uh, slides from David Schindler's work. This is from a paper he published in the summer of 2010, uh, which is what uh, really caught everybody's attention. One of the things he did which nobody had thought to do before was to sample the pollutants in the snow that accumulates over the winter. Now if you think about it, uh, air pollution from those upgraders, normally it will be blown, of course, far and wide. Uh, and uh, as an aside, actually it does blow quite far. Uh, there's acid rain problems in northern Saskatchewan because of the upgrader uh, air pollution. Uh, but it's, uh, it's essentially dispersed, and of course it is a source of pollution, but it is fairly dispersed. However, during the winter, uh, the air pollution as it settles out uh, onto the surface will accumulate in the snow, and it will therefore stay there until the snow melts. Now it turns out that when snow spring comes, the snow melts rather quickly over a period of a few days and will dump its accumulated winter load of pollutants into the surface water system very quickly, precisely at a time uh, when fish are swimming upstream, embryos are developing, and there's the greatest potential for damage to the fish population. This is one of the things that David Chandler de demonstrated. Nobody had thought to do this kind of sampling before. And here are two of his graphs. You'll see he took daily samples. These are days in April of 1990, measuring two parameters, the conductivity and the pH level of the water, which show extremely dramatic changes over a four-day period. Uh, the uh, conductivity drops because of dilution from the uh, pollutants, and the pH uh, becomes more acid by two and a half uh, uh, points. So a very significant change at precisely the wrong moment, if you like, when uh, when the fish are developing. So this is something that Ramp had not thought to do. They had not sampled the snowpack, and it turned out a lot of the things that J.B. Chindler found, the labs that, that Ramp was using uh, did not have the right uh, kind of detection limits, and they would not, wouldn't have found the chemicals uh, in their water samples, even if they collected them at the right time. Uh, <coughs> 
Greg showed before a couple of the maps of the sample locations that have been used in the, uh, in the um, Athabasca area. These numbers, AR1 to AR12, are standard sample sites that have been used for a long time for sampling the Athabasca River, which is what AR stands for, of course. And uh, so what this shows is the, uh, uh, is the loading of um, polyaromatic compounds in the snowpack at these 12 sites down the Athabasca River, uh, and showing, of course, uh, tremendous peaks right out opposite uh, the, the um, oil sands operations that are loaded, lo located on the banks of the Athabasca River, some 30, 40 kilometers north of uh, Fort McMurray. Similarly, in a couple of the, the, um, uh, the tributary rivers that flow into the Athabasca, you can see the same uh, peak loading. You'll notice that there's uh, little or no polyaromatic carbons, hydrocarbons, in the waters up dip from the uh, upstream from the from the uh, processing plants or downstream either. So the location there close to the processing clearly indicates that they got there by uh, air transportation. Uh, these, this diagram shows the loading of, uh, uh, of heavy metals also in the snowpack. And it's worth just reading what, uh, uh, what David Schindler said about this in his paper. The increased deposition of particulates and polyaromatic compounds in snow close to the sun core and sin crude upgrading facilities clearly implicates them as sources. The enrichment of snow particulates by the more volatile PAC is typical of PAC volatilized by heat or particulates produced by combustion. The dominance of oily material in snow from AR6 near Sanko Voyager also suggests a separate organic bitumen phase in stack emissions that is present as droplets larger and less buoyant than average particulates and precipitates near the source. Was this kind of data and this kind of statement that was in fact quite new and quite definitive in terms of where, what pollution was there, where it was coming from. And, uh, <clears throat> and of course, as an aside, pointing out that this has not been demonstrated by any government-run programs or industry-run programs up to this point. So it was quite clear that something needed to be done. Now, just to complete this story, uh, the tailings ponds, of course, are amongst the most visible of the environmental issues concerned with the oil sands and the what are called the mature fine tailings, these very fine clay pot particles that uh, uh, that are part of the tailings uh, have resisted large-scale management and treatment for a very long time. They, they simply won't settle. That's the problem. The tailings just sit there year after year after year. The clay won't settle. Uh, and, and until it does, very little can be done. Uh, so there's all kinds of, of um, uh, clever uh, engineering projects underway in industry at the uh, Water Research Institute, University of Alberta, and many other places to try and find a way of dealing with this. One of the processes that we were told about during our federal panel work in 2010 was a process that Suncor was developing using a common water treatment chemical called polyacrylamide, which causes the clay particles to flocculate, which means they become larger particles. They then settle out, and you're left with clear water, which can then be processed for residual uh, dissolved chemicals and hopefully return to the water system, or at least stored permanently in what's called an end pit lake. Uh, so there is hope that this problem can be dealt with, and uh, as Greg mentioned, this is one of the major issues that this new uh, alliance, uh, COSIA, the Canadian All Science Innovation Alliance, hopefully will be able to deal with. And it is, in fact, very exciting that they have agreed, the large companies have agreed to share patents and experience and resources in this way. This is a very new thing for uh, any competitive industry, so it bodes well for the future. Uh, the federal panel report that we published in December 2010, cover is shown there. Uh, the Alberta Environmental Monitoring Panel report that came out in uh, late June of 2011 is shown on the right. And in the middle, uh, an expert panel report carried out by the Royal Society of Canada, which I was not part of, uh, was uh, led by uh, Steve Rudy, a, a public health uh, researcher specializing in water chemistry from the University of Alberta, uh, and his team did a very, very thorough academic review of all the known information on the health and social effects of the oil sands industry. It was a very, very useful document that we used, particularly in the Alberta panel studies, to, uh, uh, to save our own uh, effort in finding out what had actually been done and what, what still needed to be done in the area. So it was a very good example of what uh, academics uh, in general and the Royal Society in particular can do when, uh, when given the right project and, and the resources to carry it to fruition. 
Now, one of the issues we have to deal with, of course, in managing this uh, whole problem is uh, who does what. Uh, as everyone here knows, in Canada we have two levels of government that are, uh, has to be said, constantly loggerheads with each other, uh, trying to decide who does what. Uh, and this is particularly the case with environmental issues that have, uh, are shared between the federal government and the, uh, the provinces and have been for a long time. Uh, the Kraken government tried to clarify issues with something called the Harmonization Agreement, which uh, he signed with uh, all except Quebec, uh, and I think it was 1998, which was supposed to divide up the responsibilities and who does what. Um, as we have just been hearing from the Harper government recently, they are deciding to offload, it would seem, even more of the responsibilities onto the, uh, onto the provincial government and reduce the federal involvement in environmental oversight. Uh, Details of this remain to be um, announced fully, um, and uh, it remains to be seen what the response of the industry and the scientific community will be to that. This is a very important step they're taking, which on the one hand certainly appears to be set to speed up environmental um, uh, processing of proposed projects. Whether this results in a weakening of environmental regulation remains to be seen. This is something we clearly have to, have to watch over carefully. Uh, and this diagram, uh, which I drew up for the environmental monitoring panel last uh, spring, uh, tries to show the situation as it was last year. Uh, it's clear, of course, that in, from the Alberta perspective, they own the resource. It is constitutionally uh, owned by the province. Uh, and so they have responsibility for licensing and approving oil sands projects uh, in the province. However, the federal government does have an overriding interest in certain aspects of the environment of the oil sands area. They are fully responsible, for example, for fisheries. And fisheries are a very big deal uh, in the oil sands, in part because it's part of the traditional uh, food source for the First Nations peoples that live there. Some very large and important communities like Fort Mackay and Fort Chippewan uh, that still live partly off the natural resources of the area. And uh, one of the things that uh, David Schindler has spent a lot of time uh, working on is the effects of oil sands pollution on the health of the fish stock in the Athabasca system. Uh, and works very closely with, particularly with the Fort Chippewan First Nations people to do that. So fisheries are uh, a, 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 an important uh, issue here and this is in fact one of the things that the Harper government has been announced that they are going to take a quote look at the Fisheries Act to see what could be done with it and of course this has made people like Schindler extremely worried uh, lest the Fisheries Act be, uh, uh, to use a fisheries term, be gutted uh, it remains to be seen exactly what they have in mind. Uh, but this is a very important issue. The federal government also, of course, has full responsibility for the health of First Nations people. And uh, <clears throat> there are several major communities uh, in the mineable area, as I mentioned, Fort Mackay and uh, uh, Fort Chippewan being two, the two major ones, and there are others. Uh, there's some Aboriginal communities at, uh, uh, at uh, Fort McMurray and further south as well. Uh, and so this is something, again, that the federal government is directly involved with. And of course, uh, also they're responsible for federal lands, the wood buffalo, and uh, transboundary issues, any pollution that crosses a boundary. The, the Athabasca River, of course, flows from Alberta into the Northwest Territories. And as I mentioned, there's the, uh, the issue of air pollution uh, from uh, the upgraders that is uh, being blown eastward into North Saskatchewan. So there's a number of levels on which the federal government uh, has current legislative responsibilities, how these will be carried through in the future remains to be seen. Their involvement up to now has been minimal. Uh, the last major involvement of the federal government in oil sands monitoring was in 1996, something called the Northern River Basin Study. That was a, an excellent joint federal-provincial uh, management uh, plan to manage the oil sands, but it was cancelled in 1996 as a result of lack of interest and diversion of funding to other, other uh, um, projects at that time. So the feds have not been involved uh, in this work for, for a very long time. Now, as a result of the two uh, panel, panels that did their work, the Alberta panel and the federal panel, the, uh, the scientists at Environment Canada will put together, to, uh, uh, put together a, a science plan that was to be carried out jointly by Alberta and the federal government. And this was announced uh, in February of this year, February uh, 3rd, it was, yes, February 3rd, the joint implementation plan um, 
the announcement of my biography actually was slightly incorrect. I was not involved as a co-author of that, but I was, of course, a co-author of the two provincial plans that went into this and was involved uh, as a reviewer of this one, but I wasn't strictly an author. I just get that clear. Academics take this kind of stuff very seriously. <laughs> so uh, this was announced as a great fanfare, and no, no question about it. It represents months of joint work by the two ministers, Diana McQueen of Alberta and Peter Kent, the federal minister, and their officials, headed up um, by Dan Wickham, who was at that time the Director General of Water Studies at Environment Canada, the gentleman that's now moved to Cosia, uh, which is an extremely exciting move in my view. He's a highly qualified, very well known and highly respected water scientist, so he couldn't be better uh, as a leader of this new group. The, um, the one uh, uh, flaw that we saw as scientists with this plan uh, was the fact that it was going to be administered by the two levels of government. Now, we talk a lot about openness and transparency, and one of the difficulties that we've seen with governments is that they tend not to be very transparent. Uh, this has particularly become apparent with the, the uh, federal government uh, as of now. Uh, as we know, uh, to be quite blunt about it, scientists in the federal government have been muzzled. They are not allowed to speak publicly. Uh, so this is a serious impediment. Uh, to the kind of work that we would hope that the scientists involved in this plan would be undertaking. So this we saw uh, as a flaw. The program will be co-led by the Assistant Deputy Minister of Science and Technology, Environment Canada, and the Assistant Deputy Minister of Science and Monitoring, Alberta Environment and Water. These are all fine people. I've worked with all of them. But <clears throat> the point is that they would then still be under the line management of their political masters. And this was not a good idea. Well, several of my colleagues on the Alberta panel uh, put a lot of pressure on the Alberta government over the winter, uh, and in uh, March uh, 13th, uh, Minister Diana McQueen, the uh, Minister of Environment and Water in Alberta, announced the formation of a new working group uh, headed up by uh, two of the people that were formerly on the, the in Alberta Environmental Monitoring Panel to examine this whole issue of governance. So it looks like uh, they uh, realize that there needs to be uh, a separation of this project from direct authority or land management of government, uh, and hopefully they will do what we recommended uh, on our Alberta report, which was to establish something we call the Alberta Environmental Monitoring Commission, which will be fully independent of industry, although largely paid for by industry funding, uh, and fully independent from government, able to publish their work transparently, feed data into this uh, uh, online accessible database or data portal that Greg talked about, uh, and that would be the ideal uh, arrangement. Now, of course, there's a change of government, or possibly a change of government about to happen in Alberta. We don't know who's going to win the upcoming election. Uh, the uh, report from this working group is due, I believe, at the end of June, by which time the new government, whoever, whichever party forms it, uh, will be in place. Uh, if, of course, it's the Wild Rose Party, we could potentially start from square one all over again. I hope not, but that remains a possibility. So what are the uh, long-term issues that we still need to deal with? Uh, restoration and reclamation is a really big one. Uh, and this picture here, which comes from the CAP website, uh, shows the only small area of the mineable mine sites that has undergone uh, full restoration and it's been certified back to its original condition, the so-called Gateway Hill site. It's uh, 104 hectares of fully restored boreal forest. And uh, there's no question that it's a, it's, a, it's a real forest, the caribou back wandering through it again, and uh, the birds are there and the flowers are blooming and so on. Uh, and I'm, I'm not trying to be supercilious here. This is, this is unquestionably uh, a small success story. It can be done and it is being done. However, this is a very big problem. Uh, or a very big project, perhaps I should say. I won't say problem because it can be done, but project, yes, it's very big. Uh, as David Schindler in another of his recent studies has pointed out, uh, there's huge areas of wetland and peatland that will be forever destroyed by the surface mining operations and also, if not destroyed, certainly impeded uh, and affected by the in situ mining operations. And uh, the restoration of peatland cannot be done, of course. That is something that nature has to do all by itself over thousands of years, the compression and, uh, and gradual decay of organic material. Uh, there is the hope that wetlands can be restored, but these are very ecologically complex areas. 
and uh, it's felt by Schindler and his colleagues at University of Alberta that this is something that's still possibly beyond us. So there is hope there that it can be done, but certainly no proof that it can be done. The uh, pond number one, as I mentioned, uh, here it is. Uh, uh, it's been held back. This was uh, until a couple of years ago. This was a tailing pond, so this was open water. The tailings have now been dried out and removed, and the place has been reseeded and grassed over. And as you can see, uh, we have the beginnings now of the making of a new piece of boreal forest there. Uh, as you can see, it's been held up uh, from the Athabasca River by this 200 meter high dike that was built over um, Tar Island, which is just on the edge of the picture there. The river formerly flowed sort of across the corner of the, of the pond, where that's now been filled with tailings. So this, this is restoration in process, but this is only one pond. It has to be the very first one, uh, and they're certainly working on it. Uh, this is from the information portal that uh, Greg mentioned, this uh, new website where you can go and extract information, and you click on the right uh, request, and this is the map that uh, appears on the screen. It shows the restoration uh, that has been completed to date. Fully restored areas shown in this dark green color, and as you can see, that's all there is so far, the Gateway Hill area. Notice the size of the oil sands mineable area. Uh, eventually, uh, all of this will be disturbed, and ideally, all of it will be restored. I think you get the sense here what a vast, vast uh, project this is going to be, and we've really only just made a tiny little beginning on it. The um, portal also contains this diagram which talks about progress from 2000 uh, and uh, uh, two dates here. This is 2006, I think. Anyway, progress in, in, uh, uh, in, in managing the, the gradual restoration of, of uh, cleared area uh, through the various stages, the temporary storage of soils and seeds and so on, and then its gradual replacement. Uh, in 2009, as you can see, the fully certified Land is only this little tiny red line right at the top there out of this entirely uh, large area. So to conclude then, I just want to sum up with the remaining issues. And uh, uh, I, I fully believe in the, in the goodwill uh, of the industry and its government managers. However, there is enormous uh, costs involved. And so when we talk about uh, air and water pollution, <coughs> It certainly can be managed. We, we realized this when studying what had already been done. Organizations like the Wood Buffalo Environmental Association are doing extremely good work on air quality monitoring. The water quality monitoring can certainly be brought up to comparable standards with the right kind of, uh, of approach, the right sort of scientists involved in the right sort of management level. So the question is, will COSIA live up to its, uh, its promise? Will the joint implementation plan that's been announced be effective? And that's, a, that's very much a management issue and how willing uh, the, uh, uh, the industry, the government, and ultimately, of course, the taxpayer are willing to put money uh, into making this, this whole business work. Water use can be substantially reduced. And as Greg mentioned, there's more and more use being made of this deep saline water. But uh, there's an issue that's becoming acute, particularly also with things like shale gas. If we go on pumping poison water down under high pressure into an existing water system, what will happen in the end? Will this displace that water somewhere else? Could it rise to the surface? Could it pollute surface fresh groundwater? That's less of an issue in uh, the oil sands, of course, because there's almost nobody living at the surface, so that's not a particularly a problem. But certainly one that's becoming a problem in shale gas operations in, in more populated areas. But the, the, the long-term disturbance of deep saline uh, groundwater systems is something that nobody has studied. We have no idea actually what will happen in the long term. So that is an issue and a question. Cumulative effects management is a very big deal and something that nobody really has talked about. The Alberta government is responsible for licensing projects, but it does it on a one-by-one -one project basis. And of course, as the number of projects uh, increases, um, their effect becomes cumulative. You have a large mine and then you open up another one next to it and then another one next to that. Of course, you're progressively disturbing more and more of the wildlife habitat. There's more and more potential for pollution of the air and the water. And there's really nobody that's effectively taken control of that issue as a long-term problem. So cumulative effect management uh, is an issue. Uh, the First Nations people are particularly vocal about this because, of course, they're seeing the 
habitat for fish and for caribou and other wildlife uh, gradually diminish. Their access to hunting lands is decreasing rapidly. They have to travel further to get the same um, value and so on. So the question arose in our Alberta discussions. What about simply putting a limit on growth? Uh, putting a, say, uh, just to pick a number out of the air, say 5% or 10% of the mineable area has to be left undeveloped at all times so as to prevent complete breakdown of habitat. And that, that number is just one you could pick. You say 15%, 20%, whatever. That, of course, would, would require um, a limit on growth, a limit on development, which is a big issue. Uh, Will, will society, will industry, will the government uh, uh, tolerate that? Is, is that a compromise that, that we could reach? I think it's a very important question. Reclamation, we've talked about that, uh, and you've seen, I think, how big the issue is. It's going to be extraordinarily expensive to do complete restoration. And we've seen that, in general, it has to be said, mining industries have not been very good about cleaning up after themselves. Anyone that's seen an old gold mine in Northern Ontario will confirm that remark. There's, there's uh, old abandoned buildings and tailings ponds everywhere, poisoned rivers. Uh, there's some very nasty things that have been left behind because, of course, once the gold is gone, there's no more income, the companies go bankrupt, so there's nobody left with any money left to fix anything up. It's an old problem. So what about these large reclamation projects? There are uh, uh, reclamation bonds uh, required to be posted by the companies to pay for future cleanup costs, but concerns have been expressed that the, the uh, sums are not adequate, uh, and this remains a big issue that will have to be dealt with uh, somewhere down the line. Uh, and hopefully it, will, it won't fall entirely to the taxpayers to bear these costs. The uh, effectiveness of this joint implementation plan remains to be uh, determined. It's uh, come down largely to an issue of governance and whether the uh, two levels of government are willing to put in place the kind of science-based programs that have been recommended. Uh, <clears throat> scientists are expensive people. You know, if you want good ones, you've got to offer them full careers, which means long-term employment, proper labs, and technical support, and so on. It's not cheap. But to do the job properly, this, is, has to, this has to be how it's going to be done. So hopefully that's something that will occur. First Nations people have been left out of almost all of this. Um, and we began to notice in our discussions at both levels of uh, the panel work and the kinds of um, consultations we were doing in the field, First Nations people, nobody really seems to talk about them. And yet their concerns are what have got the public, particularly internationally, uh, very concerned. Uh, and they have told us, the consultations we have done with First Nations people, they have told us they're very tired of the white man coming to them and telling them what they're going to do and then basically not doing it. Um, they would like very much to be involved in management of their own affairs. And uh, uh, <clears throat> this issue of traditional environmental knowledge, I think, offers considerable potential here. This is uh, traditional environmental knowledge simply means the knowledge that First Nations people have as a result of their hunting and fishing activities. This is something that could quite readily be formalized and, and integrated into um, an observational process for uh, uh, observing how the land is responding to development, what's happening to the fish stock, what's happening to the uh, uh, berry bearing uh, uh, bushes downwind from the upgraders, um, how are the caribou surviving, the odor problems and the noise and so on. All these kinds of things uh, could make serious use of, of First Nations traditional knowledge if they're integrated uh, into the uh, observational framework. And this does need to happen because this is a, a, a huge, uh, the word irritant doesn't quite cover it. It's much bigger than an irritant. This is a very major uh, human problem that has to be resolved. Um, and, of course, largely the big question, who's going to pay for all of this? Um, ultimately, I think there's no question, us as consumers of oil and gas have to help pay for this problem. It's no good just to say, oh, the companies should pay for all that, they're making all the profits. But the fact of the matter is that our developed lifestyle depends on the use of oil and gas. So ultimately, we're all beneficiaries from the industry, and we should all help pay for it one way or another. How that's to be worked out, I don't know. But there's one thing we can do. And that's helped keep everybody's feet to the fire to make sure this problem doesn't go away, gets dealt with properly. So I'll stop there. Thanks.
Thank you very much, uh, both the gentlemen, for two very enthralling uh, presentations. Uh, before uh, uh, we open it up to questions, uh, we're wondering if, if either of you has any comments on the other one's uh, presentation. <laughs> Yeah, lots, but let's do it through questions. <laughs> okay, we'll do it through questions. <laughs>